praise uh, the living God. And uh, once again, this is Sammy Wilberforce welcoming to you to the part two of two of our presentation, Edit That One, Vindicated. And so uh, like us to just uh, have a word of prayer and go on to this presentation of uh, part two. Our dear Father in heaven, may thy will be done on earth as cities uh, in heaven, Lord. That which the angels contemplate, the plan of redemption, let it be our contemplation. And above all, Lord, help us to have a closer relationship with you. In such a time as this, we need an anchor that is sure. And Lord, we know that with thee and the Son as the captain of the host, uh, we shall be led into the right way. And so continue guiding our minds as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. And so in the previous presentation, Edith that one vindicated putting together the pieces of Daniel 9 prophecy, we looked at uh, this uh, picture, which I told you that uh, it was... Um, uh, it came from Brother Adrian Evans. And uh, we were able to see from evidences, different comment, uh, commentaries, and even from uh, the past of us that uh, actually the dating of uh, the 70 weeks and the 2300 days, the greater prophecy starts in 457 BC. Now, we looked closely at uh, 70 weeks, but now I want to look at the larger prophecy that uh, the 70 weeks was cut from, which is 2,300 uh, days prophecy. One of the things that uh, we were able to determine is this, that uh, the 2,300 prophecy was given in Daniel chapter 8, and it covers the period uh, or uh, uh, the empires of uh, Medo-Persia, Greece, and uh, Rome in its two phases, both uh, pagan and papal. And so we cannot say that uh, the 2300 days are literal days or 70 weeks are literal 490 days because we saw under these 70 weeks, there are a series of things that were to be done and accomplish which could not be accomplished in a literal 490 days and also looking at the issue that it was a period cut off from the 200 300 2300 days which uh, goes uh through medopatia greece and rome there is no way that prophecy can be literal days because these empires did not exist for three and a half years but um uh, existed for uh, more than three and a half years. And so um, how do we come to cement that uh, AD 31 is the true date? And in the ending of the last session, I say that you can backdate because there are people who are arguing it is 30 AD. You can backdate from 30 AD you will come to the baptism of Jesus Christ in 26 AD. You will come to his birth in 5 BC, which does not tally with the information that the Bible has given unto us. But if you backdate from that one AD coming down, you will find that actually we are brought to the year 457. Again, how can we be sure that this date is accurate? Because for 190 was cut off from the greater prophecy of 2300 days. We want to see if we take where that one AD is and go to 2300 days, which is 1844, if these things can marry or if we take it from 30 AD, which one really uh, uh, will, uh, will be able to bring us to the correct date. And so, With the 70 weeks, we are now through to the proving of that one AD, but uh, uh, how does it fit in the larger process of 2300 days or the remaining period and other important events 
that are connected to it. The 70 weeks are but the first 490 years of the 2300 year period. You take 490 from 2300 and there remains 1810, 1810. And the 490 as we have seen ended in the autumn of AD 34 by the stoning of uh, Stephen. If so, if uh, to this date we now add the remaining 18, 10 years, we shall have the termination of the whole period uh, 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 and it gives us the date. So to, uh, to AD 34, you add 1810 and we have the autumn of 1844. If you add 1810 to AD 30, it brings you to 1843 and not 1844. And uh, it has been, pro been proven and it can be proved that uh, the investigative judgment started in October 22, 1844. And so we can still take, if you take 490 from 2300 days, you have 1810. Now, what you can do is take the year 1844, which has been proved to be the year of investigative judgment, and subtract 1810, and then you will come to AD 31, and that will prove uh, the period. But um, why in 1844, why do we choose the date 1844? The query may arise how the days can be extended to the autumn of 1844 if they began in 457 BC, as it requires only 1843 years in addition to the 457 to make the whole uh, uh, 2300 days. Attention to one fact will clear the point of difficulty. It takes 457 full years before Christ and 1843 full years after to make 2300 days, so that if the period began with the first day of 57, it will not terminate till the very last day of 1843. Now, it will be evident to all that if any part of the year 457 passed away before 230, 2300 days began, just so much of the year 1844 must pass away before they will end also. We therefore have to inquire from what point in the year 457 are we to begin our reckoning? From the fact that the first 49 years were allotted to the building of the street and wall, we learn that uh, the period is to be dated not from the starting of Ezra uh, from Babylon, but the actual beginning of the work in Jerusalem. Because people say, okay, the decree has been given. And so we start dating from immediate day that the decree is given. But... Um, that will not bring you to the autumn. You have to start at the actual beginning of the work at Jerusalem. The beginning could hardly be earlier than the seventh month, the autumn of 15, 457, as he did not arrive at Jerusalem until the fifth month of that year. And you can get that in Ezra chapter 7, verses 9. In Ezra 7, verses 9, uh, uh, this is um, what um, we have in the word of God. It reads, For upon the first day of the first month began he, go, he to go up from Babylon. Look at this. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon. Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. And so the command covers, uh, the, the prophecy covers the command, but not only that, but also the beginning of uh, the work itself, the beginning of the work itself. The whole period will therefore extend to the seventh month autumn in Jewish time of 1844. And so the momentous declaration made by the angel Daniel unto 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed is now explained in our search for the meaning of the sanctuary and it cleansing and the application of the time we found that uh, that this subject can be easily understood. Um, 
and uh, the accomplishment of these events. And so uh, let us pause for a moment and uh, reflect upon the solemn position in which we are now brought in by this prophecy. Um, in the time of uh, uh, Christian era, the tabernacle of God is in heaven or the sanctuary of God is in heaven because unto 2,300 two days then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. The Jewish temple was destroyed in AD 70. And so God cannot be referring to this Jewish temple to be cleansed by the, but the sanctuary of the Lord uh, in heaven because the sanctuary on earth had been uh, uh, destroyed. Uh, this is the house not made by hands of men, but the tabernacle of the sanctuary pitched by the Lord himself and he works on behalf of penitent, penitent sinners. And so the cleansing of the sanctuary unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Uh, it, this consists of removing of the sins from it and is the closing act of the ministration performed in it that the work of salvation now send us in the heavenly sanctuary and not on the earthly sanctuary uh, because the sanctuary on the earth had been destroyed. Then the great plan of salvation devised at the fall of man is brought to the final termination uh, when uh, the sanctuary starts to be cleansed and the sins bl blotted out. Mercy no longer pleads when this work comes to an end because when it comes to an end in Revelation 16, 17, we know that the Lord says that uh, it is done. All the righteous have the gift of everlasting life. All the wicked are doomed to everlasting death. Beyond that point, no decision can be changed, no reward can be lost, and no destiny of despair can be averted. So let us look at the more evidence then of the 70 week and the period of AD 31. And uh, already we have uh, looked at uh, the issue of the Passovers, and then uh, we have looked at the baptism of uh, Jesus Christ. Now, there is something peculiar. We have to look at this uh, baptism of Jesus Christ. Um, Luke describes the preaching of John the Baptist at the time of Jesus, uh, uh, at the time Jesus was baptized. And uh, uh, I want us to turn to Luke 3, 1, and look into more evidence of 27 AD, uh, of uh, 31 AD, and not 30 AD, and even those who are doing away with the whole prophecy of um, Daniel chapter 9. And so in the book of Luke, chapter 3, verses 1. Now in the 15th year of uh, the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being uh, Tetriarch of Galilee and his brother Philip, Tetriarch of uh, Iturea and of the region of Tranchonitis and Lysimus, the Tetrarch of Abilene. This means that they ruled these places or provinces under somebody. This information also gives us an excellent historical time clue. It is remarkable that we know from every reliable secular records of that Tiberius Caesar began his sole reign in 14 AD. His 15th year will therefore be 28 AD. This date, however, is one year out using 457 BC as the commencement of the 2300 days and the 490 prophecy, and will mean the date of the decree will have to have been 456 BC. If we take the information we are given that Tiberius Caesar began his sole reign in 14 AD and his 15th year of the reign will be 28 AD. So for this reason, only some have used this date, but 456 BC is definitely wrong. The dates that most scholars agree are on either 457 or 458 BC, but neither can be reconciled with 456 BC. This means we cannot reconcile the dates and appear to have a, a one-year error. Tiberius Julius Caesar is said to have reigned from 14 AD to 37 AD, but this is his sole reign. 
After his adoption in 4 AD, Tiberius was given proconsular, that is military and tribunician, that is legislative power. And in 13 AD, he was given powers equal to that of Augustus, effectively making him ruling co-emperor. So even though his reign starts in 14 AD, in 13 AD, he had the power which was he was really practicing or exercising uh, being a co-emperor uh, uh, with uh, uh, Augustus. So when Augustus died in 14 AD, and then Tiberius came into rulership, it is something he had been practicing as a co-emperor from 13 AD. The question of succession was a non-issue as Tiberius already had the power of the emperor. The 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar using the date of his sole reign would make the baptism of Jesus in 28 AD. Many forget to use inclusive years and so erroneously get to 29 AD. The correct calculation is 14 AD plus 15 minus one years, which is 28 AD. But this, as we just noted, still cannot be reconciled with the decree date to rebuild Jerusalem. But when you allow for the joint rule with Augustus for one year prior to 14 AD, then the baptism of Jesus is, of course, one year earlier, and that is in 27 AD. I hope that we understand what I'm speaking about. The calculation becomes 13 AD plus 15 minus 1, which comes to 27 AD. This now aligns with the other evidence we have for the starting date of 457 BC to rebuild Jerusalem. And so you can observe uh, it. Uh, you can look into Encyclopedia Britannica 2009 uh, online in uh, 16 June 2009. And the link is there. I'll be able to put the document, the link for the document in the in the comment section of the presentation on YouTube and Facebook so that you may go through this. So although Augustus was now feeling his age, these years in association with the Tiberius were marked by administrative innovations. And the conversion of the hitherto occasional appointment of perfect of prefect of the city, that is um, Prefectus uh, Urbi, into a permanent office, AD 13, when in the same year the powers of Augustus were renewed for 10 years, such a renewals had been granted at intervals throughout the reign. Tiberius was made his equal in every constitutional respect. And you can read that uh, in um, en.wikipedia.org slash wiki slash Tiberius. So um, in any case, something happened. There was a transition that was uh, put in place prior. And that was in 13 AD. So that um, in coming to 14 AD, when he had to renew his powers, already they seeing the years that he was gone in years, they put Tiberius in uh, uh, in office to rule as a co-emperor with him and uh, gave him all the powers of legislative. And so this was uh, a co-emperor unto him. And in 14 AD, we find that uh, he died and Tiberius was able to continue with uh, the power without a lot of transition. So uh, the death of uh, Gaius in AD 4 initiated a flurry of activity in the household of Augustus. Tiberius was adopted as full son and heir and in turn, he was required to adopt Augustus' nephew, Gena, um, there is uh, Germanicus, the son of his brother, Drusus, and uh, Augustus' niece, Antonio, Antonia Minor. Along with his adoption, Tiberius received tribunician power as well as the share of Augustus' Maya's imperium, something that even Marcus Agrippa may never have had. In AD 7, Agrippa Postumus was disowned by um, Augustus and burned to the island of uh, Planitia to live in solitary confinement. Thus, when in AD 13, the powers held by Tiberius were made equal rather than a second to Augustus' own powers, he was for all intents and purposes a core princeps with Augustus. And in the event of the latter's passing, 
will simply continue to rule without an interregnum or impose or uh, possible uh, uh, up, uh, uh, upheaval. Agas died in AD 14 at the age of 76 and no transition was made because already uh, Tiberius had had the power in AD 13. And so you have AD 13 uh, and adding uh, 15 years of uh, his rulership now, uh, minus one, it actually brings us to 27 AD. And so more from uh, the pain uh, of uh, inspiration, reading from Great Controversy, page 325 to 328 for just uh, more of uh, inspired information on this date of AD 31. And uh, I'm reading from the book, Great Controversy, pages um, 325 .2 to 328.2, GC 325.2. GC 325.2 to 328.2. I like to share from the A state rather than from the notes. But uh, allow me to do this. So, Yet God has bidden his messenger make this man to understand the vision that commission must be fulfilled in obedience to it. The angel sometime afterward returned to Daniel saying, I am now come forth to, for, forth to give the skill and understanding. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Now, hold on a minute. In Daniel chapter 9, Angel Gabriel comes when Daniel is praying to give an understanding to the vision. If you want to know that 490 are cut off from 2300 days, this is the part that makes this thing meet hand and glove. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel does not have any vision. He is praying. And the angel returns to make him understand. Because when Daniel chapter 8 is ending, he says that Anan understood the vision and he was sick for some days. Why was he sick? He knew that uh, the captivity of uh, the children of Israel had to last for 70 years. But then the angel Gabriel gave him another period, which is 2300 days, and this made him sick. And he didn't understand the mare, that is uh, the inner sanctuary, time prophecy. We have the Chazon, which is the total vision of uh, Daniel chapter 8, the totality of the vision, but we have the Mare, which deals with the 2300 uh, uh, day prophecy. None understood the vision. There are other things that Daniel understood, but he was told this one, you will not understand it. And even at the end, he's told, go thy way, you shall stand in your lot at the end of the time or at the time of the end. So while he is praying and confessing the sins of the people, the angel Gabriel comes and say, now I have come to do what? To make you understand the vision. The vision you didn't understand. What vision did you not understand? The 2300 days. So I've come. And then he says, 70 weeks are cut off or determined. From what? From the vision you didn't understand. I hope uh, that makes sense. And so Daniel 8, 27, Daniel 8, 16, and Daniel 9, 22, 23. I've come that you may understand the matter, Daniel 9, 25 to 27. There was one important point in the vision of chapter 8, which had been left unexplained, namely that relating to the time, the period of the 2300 days. Therefore, the angel, in resuming his explanation, dwells chiefly upon the subject of time. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth 
of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. The angel had been sent to Daniel for the express purpose of explaining to him the point which he had failed to understand in the vision of the eighth chapter. The statement relative to time and to 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. After bidding Daniel understand the matter and consider the vision, the very first words of the angel are 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy seat. The word here translated determined literally signifies cut off 70 weeks representing 490 years or declared by the angel to be cut off as specially pertaining to the Jewish. But from what were they cut off? As the 2300 days was the only period of time mentioned in chapter 8, it must be the period from which the 70 weeks were cut off. The 70 weeks must therefore be a part of the 2300 days and the two periods must begin together. The 70 weeks are declared by the angel to date from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. So there is the restoration and the building itself. If the date of this commandment could be found, then the starting point for the great period of the 2300 days would be as a 10. So in the seventh chapter of Ezra, the decree is found in Ezra 7, 12 to 26, as we saw. In it is completest form, it was issued by a Texas king of Persia in 457 BC. But uh, in Ezra 6, 14, the house of the Lord at Jerusalem is said to have been built according to the commandment. That is the decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxas, king of Persia. These three kings, in originating, reaffirming, and completing the decree, brought it to the perfection required by the prophecy to mark the beginning of the 2300 years. Taking 457 B.C., the time when the decree was completed as the date of the commandment, every specification of the prophecy concerning the 70 weeks was seen to have been fulfilled. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, namely 69 weeks or 483 years. The decree of a Texas went into effect in the autumn of 457 B.C. From this date, 483 years extend to the autumn of AD 27, and we are told to see the appendix of uh, great controversy. At that time, this prophecy was fulfilled. The word Messiah signifies the anointed one. In the autumn of AD 27, Christ was baptized by John and received the anointing of the Spirit. The Apostle Peter testified that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power in Acts 10.38. And the Savior himself declared in Luke 4.18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. After his baptism, he went into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled in Mark 1.14 and 15. And then he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. The week here brought to view is the last one of the 70. It is the last seven years of the period allotted especially to the Jewish. During this time, extending from AD 27 to AD 34, Christ at first in person and afterward by his disciples extended the gospel invitation, especially to the Jewish. As the apostles went forth with the good tidings of the kingdom, the Savior's direction was, go not in the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, and I not, but go rather to the lost sheep of Israel, of the house of Israel in Matthew 10, 5, 6. Continued on, in Great Converse we read, in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. In AD 31, three and a half years after his baptism, our Lord was crucified. With the great sacrifice offered upon Calvary ended that system of offerings which for 4,000 years had pointed forward to the Lamb of God. Type had met anti-type, and all the sacrifices and oblations of the ceremonial system were there to cease. 
The 70 weeks or 490 years especially allotted to the Jewish ended as we have seen in AD 34. At that time, through the action of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the nation sealed it is a rejection of the gospel by the martyrdom of Stephen and the persecution of the followers of Christ. Then the message of the salvation no longer restricted to the chosen people was given to the world. The disciples forced by persecution to flee from Jerusalem went everywhere preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Peter, divinely guided, opened the gospel to the centurion of Caesarea, the God-fearing Cornelius and the ardent Paul, worn to the faith of Christ, was commissioned to carry the glad tidings for far hands into the Gentiles in Acts 8, 45 and Acts 22, 21. Thus, far every specification of the prophecy is strikingly fulfilled and the beginning of the seventh week is fixed beyond question at 457 BC and their expiration in AD 34. From this data, there is no difficulty in finding the termination of the 2300 days. The 70 weeks, 490 days having been cut off from the 2300 days, there were 1810 days remaining. After the end of 490 days, the 1810 days were still to be fulfilled. From AD 34, add 1810 years, it extends to 1844. Consequently, the 2300 days of Daniel 814 terminate in 1844. At the expiration of this great prophetic period, upon the testimony of the angel of God, the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Thus, the time of the cleansing of the sanctuary, which was almost uni universally believed to take place at the second advent, was definitely pointed out. And so we see from the great controversy from that historical sketches that um, actually the date for uh, the crucifixion was in AD 31 and baptism in AD 27. And so there have been questions on the dates that uh, Jesus Christ was crucified. And uh, we have people say that uh, there are dates, uh, there is a proposed Wednesday crucifixion, but uh, time does not match under time. Think about this. Think about this. With the Wednesday crucifixion, let us look at the Wednesday crucifixion itself and see if it matches. Um, When you take Wednesday 14th Nisan to be the day of uh, the, the crucifixion, then this is what you have, the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Passover. And then on Thursday 15th, it is the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, a Sabbath day. And on Friday, women prepare spices to anoint uh, Jesus. Now, you are having a host of problems because uh, the seventh day, which is 17th Nisan, will be the day of the first fruits. We will be having it on this day, either Friday or Saturday. On Sunday, the third day, it can be. It can be because you'll miss the first fruit. And we understand that Christ resurrected not on, uh, on uh, a Friday, but he resurrected on the first day of the week. That is what the Bible says. And so if you have the crucifixion burial before sundown, then he rests on the tomb on Thursday under the Roman guard said, then uh, again, if you will have to have him resurrect, then he is also resurrecting on the tomb on uh, 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 Friday and then the resurrection on Sabbath, late in that day before sunset, which actually doesn't tally in any way. The Wednesday crucifixion is taught by Dr. Frederick Casey Price of uh, Ever Increasing Faith Ministries. Now, so the Wednesday crucifixion and the problem of fast fruit. 
we cannot be having the fast food on uh, Friday. Note that with a Wednesday crucifixion and a literal 72 hours in the grave, the resurrection will occur on Saturday Sabbath, which will, should precisely match the day of fast food 16 Nisan, but does not. With a Wednesday crucifixion, fast food 16 Nisan will fall on Friday, meaning the resurrection should also be on Friday. This, however, is a day short of the 72 hour span they are bound to. So they ob obviously can put uh, fast food on Friday. And uh, there are many things that uh, we can keep looking on the Wednesday crucifixion. Now, look at, uh, again, this Saturday fast food. Proponents of our Wednesday crucifixion are really forced into a Saturday resurrection by their maintaining strict adherence to the 72-hour, three-day, three-night scenario. Saturday then, if it is the resurrection day, should also be the day of first fruits. But this violates what is set forth in Leviticus 23.11, which states that the first fruit occurs the day after the Sabbath, meaning the day after the 15th Nisan Sabbath, first day of unleavened bread in Leviticus 23 verse 7. So first fruits could not have been on Saturday since, as indicated in the above chart, it would clearly not be after a Sabbath. So Saturday is clearly disqualified from being first fruit. Then Sunday first fruit, neither by the Wednesday theory could first fruit occur on Sunday, though that would place it after the Sabbath, because that again places the resurrection on Sunday, which extends past the 72 hour rule they wish to adhere to rigorously. To. A Sunday resurrection will make it the fourth day after the crucifixion. Proposing a Wednesday crucifixion and a Sunday fast food means adding two days to the scenario and again denying that 16th Nisan is the resurrection day and a day of fast food, thus breaking the type anti-type anti -type pattern. Since Sunday cannot possibly be called the third day since Jesus' crucifixion and burial under the Wednesday crucifixion theory, and can be 16 Nisan either, it must also be disqualified as the day of fast food. It will seem to be clear that under the Wednesday crucifixion theory, fast food 16 Nisan can be fitted in anywhere and remain harmonious with scripture. Therefore, this completely excludes the possibility of a Wednesday crucifixion and 72 hour theory that will promote, that some will promote. Proposed Thursday crucifixion. Let us look at it. You have the 14th Nisan on Thursday, Lord's Passover, the preparation day, crucifixion, and burial before sundown, and first day of the unleavened bread occurs on Friday. Women prepare spices rested in the tomb and Roman guard. Then we have the seventh day rested in the tomb, Roman guard continues. And then we have first fruits, that is Sunday, resurrection before sunrise tomb, discovered to be empty. Is this the third day? Actually, if you look at it, in as it is indicated in Luke 24, 21, it's not. It is the fourth day and not the third day. Those who advocate a Thursday crucifixion propose that there, are, there were back-to-back -back Sabbaths the year of the crucifixion. This is based on the interpretation of the word Sabbath in the crucifixion narrative in its plural sense, which it is proposed, indicates that they were two separate and consecutive Sabbath days observed rather than a single high Sabbath, as Luke indicates that that day was a high Sabbath. This proposed chronology has several problems. One, first fruit does not occur on 16th, but it occurs on 17th. But since they say that we had two Sabbaths, then actually uh, they, they take it that it was not a single high Sabbath, but two Sabbaths. The day following the crucifixion is not a seventh day Sabbath, but it must be as established in anchor point two above. Scripture makes no direct mention of two consecutive Sabbath days in any of the gospel narratives. By Jewish reckoning, any part of a day is counted as a full day. The Thursday crucifixion theory places the resurrection on the fourth day, not on the third day. The Jewish priesthood will deliberately delay, that is, the uh, the declaration of the new moon, Kiddush, Hachedesh, 
her actual dish by one day in order to prevent the inconvenience of back-to-back -back servers. They still do this to this day. Now, another proposal is the Friday crucifixion. So we find that the Wednesday crucifixion won't work it. And um, the Thursday crucifixion also won't work it. So let us look at the Friday crucifixion. You have 14th Nisan on Friday, and that is preparation day in the Lord's Passover. And so night we have the first day of unleavened bread is eaten. And Lord's Supper, Christ arrested in Gethsemane and put on trial. Then we have during the day the Passover lamb slain in the evening between the two evenings. That is afternoon, crucifixion and burial before sundown, women prepare the spices. And then we have the 15th Nisan, um, which is uh, the Sabbath or the seventh day Sabbath, first day of uh, festival of unleavened uh, bread. Night, a high double holy day, that is night and day. Rested in the tomb, and then rested in the tomb, Roman guard set by end of the day. And then we had 16th Nisan, which is Sunday, the Omer, that is the day of the first fruit. The night session, the third day, according to Luke 24, 21. And then during the night session, resurrection before the sunrise tomb, discovered to be empty just before the sunrise. And so Passover, 14th Nisan is the type of the crucifixion day and occurs before the seventh day Sabbath. The day following the crucifixion is not only a seventh day Sabbath, but also the beginning of the feast of the unleavened bread. That is 15th Nisan, making that Sabbath a high double Sabbath. In, on 16th Nisan, the day of first fruit, a clear type of the resurrection day occurs after Sabbath day, but it's not itself a Sabbath day. And so... Uh, in this account, we have evidences of 14th Nisan Friday in Matthew chapter 26, verses 20 to chapter 27, verses 61. And uh, uh, we have in Luke chapter 22 and in John chapter 14. On the 15th Nisan, which is the Sabbath, a high Sabbath, we have the evidences on Matthew 27, 62 to 27, 66. And uh, this is Mark chapter 16, verse 1, uh, and in Luke 23, but it is missing in the book of John. 16 Nisan, as uh, the resurrection day or the day of the first fruit, it is supported in the book of Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 28, verse 15. Also supported in Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 16, verses 13. Also supported in Luke 24, 1 to 24, 53. And uh, John chapter 20, verses 1 to 20, uh, 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 verses 23. Observation then. The only chronology that can be reconciled with scripture on all points is the Friday crucifixion and Sunday resurrection. It is the only scenario in which the typical festival days and their fulfillment match exactly with a single discrepancy. Now, there is uh, astronomical... Uh, evidences that uh, I want to go through as uh, we bring this to an end. Is there any astronomical evidence of the 31 AD crucifixion, the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the first fruit marching? What do we do then with the astronomy information that has been presented validating AD 30 as the year of crucifixion? Dr. Cadworth, who of all others have handled this subject best, has proved from the Talmud, Mishnah, and some of the most reputable of the Jewish rabbins that the ancient Jews about our Savior's time often solemnized, solemnized as well as the Passovers as the other feast upon the ferias next before and after the Sabbath. And that as the Jews in ancient times reckoned the new moons not according to astronomical exactness, but according to the facile or moon's appearance, and as this appearance might happen a day later than the real time, consequently, there might be a whole day of difference in the time of celebrating one of these feasts, which depended on particularly day of the month. The days of the month being counted from the facile, that is the moon's appearance, uh, uh, or the, the appearance of the new moon. As he describes the whole manner of doing this, both from the Babylonish Talmud and from Maimonides, 
I shall give an exact, uh, an extract from the part of his work that the readers may have the whole argument before them. Now, this is what he says. In the great or outer court, there was a house called Beth Yazek, where the Senate sat all the 30th day of every month to receive the witness, witnesses of the moon's appearance and to examine them. If there came a proved witness on the 30th day who could state they had seen the new moon, the chief man of the Senate stood up and cried, Yudikim Mekudash, it is sanctified, and the people standing by caught the word from him and cried, Nekudash, Mekudash. But if when the consitory had sat all the day and there came no approved witness of the fascist or appearance of the new moon, then they made an intercalation of one day in the former month and decreed the following one and 30th day to be the calends. But if after the fourth or fifth day or even before the end of the month, respectable witnesses came from far and testified they had seen the new moon in its due time, the Senate were bound to alter the beginning of the month and reckon it a day sooner, this from the 30th day. As the Senate were very unwilling to be at the trouble of a second consecration when they had even fixed when they had even fixed on a wrong day, and therefore received very reluctantly the testimony of such a witnesses as those last mentioned, they afterward made a statute to this effect that whatsoever time the Senate should conclude on for the calends of the month. Though it was certain they were in the wrong, yet all were bound to order their feasts according to it. Now, it is always interesting to read the, the things that the Sanhedrin and uh, this council had to put in place. The Jewish nation and its leaders came to a point they were infallible in everything and they could not alter anything that had gone from them even if it was a wrong thing. That only tells you what kind of people Jesus had to deal with at his first coming. A nation which had imbibed Babylonian character. It had also imbibed the Medo-Persian and the Grecian uh, character. And now it was in the very uh, presence of uh, pagan Rome where they were also playing to their loss. And so at the time Jesus Christ say, comes, he says that this is a people who obey me by their lips, but uh, their hearts are drawn from me, are uh, teaching the people to do the commandments of men and not the commandments of God. This is what they were practicing at that time. And so to find Dr. Cadworth talking about what they had made at that time is not something that is uh, uh, surprising to me at all. And so uh, they said that they will not alter even if they were wrong. This, Dr. Cadworth supposes, actually took place in the time of our Lord. And as it is not likely that our Lord would submit to this perversion of the original custom, and that following the true facive or appearance of the new moon confirmed by sufficient witnesses, he and his disciples ate the Passover on that day, on that day but the Jewish following the Patinacious decree of the Sanhedrin did not eat it like it till the day following. Now, Dr. Cadworth further shows from Epiphanius that there was a contention, the Yorubo, a tumult among the Jewish about the Passover that very year. Hence, it is likely that what was the real Paschal day to our Lord, his disciples, and many other pious Jews who adopted the true fascists was only the preparation or antecedent evening to others who acted on the decree of the Senate. Besides, it is worthy of note that not only the Karates, who do not acknowledge the authority of the Sanhedrin, but also the Rabbins themselves, grant that where the case is doubtful, the Passover should be celebrated with the same ceremonies two days together. And it was always doubtful when the appearance of the new moon could not be fully uh, and so uh, 
there is a statement in inspiration that says that uh, while Jesus Christ was really the Lamb of God hanging on the cross crucified for the sins of the world, these people were, were having a lamb ready for sacrifice of the Passover. And uh, uh, incidentally, it uh, uh, ran away or uh, it was freed when the uh, uh, the curtain was rent into twine. Now, Bishop Pius or Bishop my pious supposes that it was lawful for the Jewish to eat the Pascal lamb at any time between the two evenings. That is between the evening of Thursday and that of Friday. And that this permission was necessary because of the immense number of lambs which were to be killed for that purpose. As in one year, they were not fewer than 256, 500 lambs offered. And you can see Josephus in the, uh, the war, uh, the book worm. And uh, that is uh, book um, 7 in uh, chapter 9, section 3. In Matthew 26, 17, it is said, Now, the first day of the first feast of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? As the feast of unleavened bread did not begin till the day after the Passover, the 15th day of the month, Leviticus 23, 5 and 6, in Numbers 28, 16, and 17, this could not have been properly the first day of the feast, that feast. But as the Jews began to eat unleavened bread on the 14th day, Exodus 12, 18, this day was often termed the first of the unleavened bread. Now it appears that the evangelists use it in this sense and call even the Pascal day by this name, as you can see in Mark chapter 14, verse 12, and Luke 22, verses 7. Mr. Twinard, having found that our Lord was crucified the sixth day of the week, that is Friday, during the Pascal Solemnity in the 33rd year of the vulgar era, and that the Pascal moon of that year was not in conjunction with the sun till the afternoon of that day, the 19th of March, and that the new moon could not be seen in Judea until the following day, Friday, concluded that the intelligence of the facive or appearance of the new moon could not be made by the witness to the Beth Dean or Senate sooner than Saturday morning, the 21st of the March. That the first day of the first Jewish man's Nissan could not continent that 33rd year sooner than the setting of the sun on Friday, March 20th, and consequently that Friday, April 3rd, on which Christ died, was the 14th of Nissan, not the 15th the day appointed by the law of the celebration of the Passover. All these points he took care to have ascertained by the nicest astronomical calculation in which he was assisted by a very eminent astronomer and math mathematician, Bulia, Bulia, Bulia Lildas, Mr. Boiliu. And so what conclusion can we make of this? We can spend days and debate on this and... Uh, but the evidence provided before, uh, uh, we see that uh, they match up with uh, the calculation of uh, the 457 BC going forward or backtracking. You find that uh, this dates March AD 31. And the end of 2300 days cements the crucifixion in AD 31 because uh, 490 or 70 weeks are cut off from 2300 days. And if they bring us to AD 31, we are remaining with 1810 years or days. When added, we come to 1844 when the sanctuary shall be cleansed. But if you take 1844 and start backdating 1810 and the 490 years, also it brings us to 457. And so my prayer is that... Uh, uh, we may continue studying the word of the Lord that um, as we are told that uh, we may be uh, a people who can uh, rightly divide the word of God. And so I like to end where I began. There have been so much attack on uh, Adventism and the attack has not been more so from the people outside but the people from inside who have found something peculiar to hang on or uh, to be uh, 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 to be odd or um, 
to be what can I say uh, 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 to stand out in this thing they want to challenge Adventism they want to challenge uh, our prophecies and all that but then as I said I want to just end where I began in the book of Jude and uh, we are told Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave, I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should honestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who are before of all ordained to this condemnation and godly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And we can think that uh, denying our Lord God Jesus Christ is just saying that um, I don't believe in Jesus Christ. I'm not a Christian anymore, but denying the Lord Jesus Christ can happen in many ways by denying the prophecies that has been given to us by trying to water down the truth. This is one way of denying our Lord Jesus Christ, and many are doing the very same thing. Another reason why we have to contend for this is uh, what we read and i like just to remind us in uh, councils to writers and editors in council to writers and editors uh page uh, 39.3 and there are many in the church who take it for granted that they understand what they believe but until conrovas arises they do not know their own weakness. When separated from those of like faith and compelled to stand singly and alone to explain their belief, they will be surprised to see how confused are their ideas of what they had accepted as truth. Certain it is that uh, there have been among us a departure from the living God and a turning to men, putting human wisdom in place of divine. So, in view of that, we are admonished in First uh, Peter chapter 3, verse 15, First Peter chapter 3 from verse 15. But uh, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready to always give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that was whereas they speak evil of you as of evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation uh, in Christ. So be sanctified the Lord, God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer. And then Paul lastly says that um, uh, be ready uh, be ready in and out of season uh, be ready In and out of season, this is um, the book of Second Timothy. We are told, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, Second Timothy 2, 15. And so this brings us to part two uh, and uh, the part two of our presentation, Edith at one vindicated. And... Um, not only are we to study these prophecies, we have to study everything that we have believed as Adventists. And error may be hoary in age, but it does not make it truth. The sooner we understood, the sooner we found out if we are what we are understanding is truth or error, the better, so that we may not enter into these last days of the close of probation confused of what we are believing and what we have to defend because brethren we shall be brought to be poor people who are so learned and who have uh, subtle ways of twisting things and presenting what they present so as to catch us off the mark 
and lead us to error. And first of all, our relationship with God will be so much important in Jesus Christ because we are told in Matthew chapter 10, don't worry of that which you shall speak at that time because the Spirit of God will speak in you. So one of the things that we have to make sure practically is to have the indwelling power of God, is to have Jesus' reality and his presence in us. Once we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, this does not give a license to neglecting to study because the Bible says study that you may rightly divide the word of, of truth, not needing to be ashamed. And then we are told, sanctify the Lord in your heart. You know, one thing that I have found with us is that um, we are so intellectual in our doctrines, very conversant with things, but we have not sanctified the Lord in our hearts. To be able to know when to answer and even when to keep silent. The reason why we are having a lot of debates, a lot of confrontations, is that we seem to have come to truths but yet we have not sanctified the Lord in our hearts to know even how to relate and convey the same truth. And so this is what brings contention. This is what brings debates. This is what has stagnated the work. But if we have the truth and the sanctification of the truth, then we shall not use the truth as a sledge hammer. We shall not use it as a sword to uh, a sword of uh, a butcher, but then the word of the Lord shall be used as a comforter, a balm, uh, a water, an oasis in the wilderness. The word of God shall be used as a double edged sword by a physician, not a butcher. And then where there will be contention there will never be a contention there. The spirit of God in you, the spirit of God in me will bring these discordant elements in harmony. And where there is strife, there ceases to be strife. In fact, I think this is the, 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 the point that um, we have to bring this to a close. In 1888 message, uh, The spirit of God in me, what we want, uh, eighteen eighty eight messages, page uh, nine hundred and three, paragraph ten, and uh, nine hundred and four, paragraph one. Let us read this prayerfully as we close. What we want is the spirit of Jesus. When we have this, we shall love one another. Here are the credentials that we are to bear. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. We need to pray more, and when we have Christ abiding in the soul, his spirit in me will harmonize with the spirit in you. And he who controls our minds controls also the heavenly intelligences, and they cooperate with us. Then in every council, you will have the presence of one mighty in council. Jesus will be there. There will be no contention, no strife, no stirring up of the worst passions of the heart. What we want is to find refuge in Jesus. What we want is to be converted. So conversion is missing. We have the truth without the conversion. And the devil has the truth. He knows that there is one God and he trembles, but he is not a converted person. Brethren, we can be having the truth fixed in place as the demons also acknowledge Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yet we can be lacking conversion. And this is why Christ cannot come to take his church because Christ is waiting for people to be converted, not people to know the right doctrines. Right doctrines are as good as far as they go, but they are not per se a sign of conversion. And so... Uh, the messenger to the Laodicean church says, what we want is to be converted and oh how I have longed for the converting power of God to go through our assemblies. Lastly, I fear that some will never be converted. Not because God is not willing to convert them, but because they have eyes and yet see not, ears have they, but they hear not. 
They have understanding and yet understand not. They are too proud to acknowledge their errors and in condition of heart seek God in repentance. Now, shall we put away this impenitent spirit? Shall we fall on the rock and be broken? Jesus is soon coming in the clouds of heaven. What is he doing now? He is testing a people here upon the earth to see if they can live in harmony without revolt in heaven. And uh, that is a very wonderful statement because, as I have said before, you find the people saying, and you find people who call themselves present truth speakers, they say, oh, brother, I have nothing to do with you. But yet in heaven, uh, 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 I, I won't have a, a, a problem living with you. They have a problem living with people here on earth, but yet they are confident they can live with these very same people happily here after in heaven. Think about that for a moment. What God is doing is testing us here if we can live here as a family, not if we will leave them as a family. If we can go through the test and be able to live here as a family, then it won't be an, a, a hard thing to live in heaven. More so, it is easier to live uh, uh, harmoniously and as Christians where actually this presence of Christianity, even though you may say that the devil revolted in heaven where there was the presence of God and all that stuff. But understand my point. It is easier to live there. But then the hardest test that will make us live there easily is living with sinners and uh, people who contradict us, but we can still uh, have an environment and an atmosphere that is still friendly. We have been so hostile to each other. And even the reason why we differ on these things and put in a lot of things is because we want preeminence rather than submitting and humbling ourselves. And so may the conversions begin and uh, may the Lord do his work of unifying his people in this end time. And uh, shall we uh, pray in uh, closing uh Shall we humbly pray as uh, we close this session, which I believe that uh, it has been a blessing to all of you. Our dear Father in heaven, thank you for allowing us to uh, look into this prophecy. And uh, thank you for the weather and thank you for the Holy Sabbath, Lord. It's a uh, a day of blessing and we thank you. I just pray for the unification of the church, the humbling of the hearts and the spirit of humility be instilled in your people. Give us a heart of flesh and remove the heart of stone. Lord, with our carnal mind, what we are always bent to is uh, doing evil and confronting each other. Give us a spirit of meekness that... Uh, we shall even sit to listen and not be so quick to answer, but uh, to meditate upon these things. Your will be accomplished now and forevermore in Jesus' name. Amen. And so may the good Lord bless you until we venture into another series or another topic uh, altogether. And uh, bye for now.